Alright, we finally made it to the big one, Spiral Out of Control. This was my sixth and, in my opinion, still my personal favorite of my main albums. Not counting the new one, since I, I don't have enough distance from it yet, and there's, it's also so much different from all my previous stuff that I don't yet feel right comparing it to the others. We'll get to that sometime, I suppose. But back on topic, Spiral Out of Control. I do have some distance from this one now, and I have heard actual criticisms on this album. It was certainly not one that pleased everyone who heard it. I've heard people tell me that it was like a mostly uninteresting, generic 90s film score. There's a lot of people who've told me that they only like one track on the album. That's not really worth the experience of sitting down with all the way through. Though it is interesting because most of the people who said they only liked one track had a different answer for which one track they liked. Maybe they only liked the attempt at old-school, abstract, Aphex Twin-style IDM with Electric Elector, or the rush of ambient drum and bass that was Luna C, or the fast-paced ridiculousness of Space Map Go Ahead, or even just the first leg of ambient material, or the title track. I don't know, there was plenty of variety there, and that was a good sign, I'd say. And interestingly, I haven't often been told that this album was way too long, either. Because yes, this album is definitely very long. It's a double album clocking in at almost two hours with 22 total tracks. It's the longest project I've ever put out. Not a cakewalk, to say the least. But that's the thing, most of my effort on Spiral was going into justifying this album being a double album. It was a mix of tracks I released earlier that year, didn't directly make with the final album in mind. Nine of them, in fact. There was a bevy of other unreleased tracks that made for good flavor and fleshing out. There were some I homed down specifically for furthering the album. And not to mention, I was also specifically making sure that the album itself really felt like a cohesive work that fit together super well. Making sure it all sounded as good as I could possibly make it from like a mixing and mastering standpoint. Also focusing specifically on transitions between tracks and my usual continuous mix and ordering tracks and even building some to work well next to each other and flow better. No one can say this album was not a labor of love, and I'm still very proud of the way it finally turned out. If I do have problems with this album nowadays, it's that I don't think it has many of my best individual out-of-context tracks. There's a couple that stick out in my mind, Metropolis, Subway Ride, uh, Highway of Dreams, Luna Sea, though that one doesn't always feel like my own. And there are others too, but for the most part this is very much an album I like more for how it comes together as a whole than any individual part of it. I designed it to be listened to in one unbroken piece, or two unbroken pieces rather since it's a double album. But it can also work well in one sitting if you have enough time. Of course I did feel like, okay, not everyone's gonna have time to sit through a two hour album in one sitting, so I split it into the two distinct halves that could work as separate albums in their own right. That was also an interesting challenge, just the ordering and getting it to work as a double album. The two albums that most inspired me structure-wise were M83's Hurry Up We're Dreaming and Dead Mouse While One Is Less Than Two. The former mainly for its amount of tracks, like two sets of 11 tracks that were very closely related and linked, but different in their own ways like a twin brother and sister. And while One Is Less Than Two just has a very similar vibe to me to Spiral, uh, just very soundtracky and there's a first half which is a little more up-tempo, and another which is a little more down-tempo. ATB was another inspiration on that front as well. A lot of his albums are double albums with an up-tempo and a down-tempo half, though I opted to go in the reverse from ATB and Dead Mouse. Spiral's first half, The Precinct, is the more ambient and down-tempo centric half, and the second half, The Void, is its more up-tempo and banger heavy side. I also wanted to hit that right balance so that the two halves were different enough to, again, justify the structuring, but also similar enough so that they would make sense being put together in the same package. I also wanted to make the two halves mirror each other, so I structured the track listing around that. So like, for instance, the third track in each disc is one of my early brushes with using FL Studio rather than using Loops and S in Music Studio like I always did before those being The Highway of Dreams and Space Map Go Ahead. The fourth track on each disc is a more low-key, ambient interlude-ish track, Fluorescent Dio and Black Pearl Metallic. The eighth track on the two discs are Electric Collector and From the Get-Go, respectively, 
And uh, when I first made these tracks in the YouTube session I uploaded prior, those two tracks opened the session and played right next to each other. And of course, the second to last track on each disc breaks the 10 minute barrier and is meant to be some big epic to close out their respective halves of the album. Oh yeah, and the fifth track on both discs is a collaboration with a different artist. That was something I'd never done before this album. These two meetups went about very differently as well, I will say. Like, Assignment 54X2A features the talents of IDM producer Opus84, who I'd been paying attention to through some of his earliest material I was covering on the wonky angle I knew previously through my YTP stuff. It was pretty cool to see his progression as an artist and his technical improvement over the course of just a year and three albums. I had a demo I wanted to use that had a key change from G to B and an empty space in between where he could put a melody. He heard it once and told me he already had something that would fit well that he put together in his own time and sent it in after just a half hour. And it fit perfectly. It was exactly what I was looking for out of him. He even added that cassette tape sound effect you hear right after his section. Thought that was a pretty neat addition as well. Hopefully I got a couple of people to check him out via that signal boost. If you haven't, uh, go check out his Felis Cordata album. Not too far from what that little section promises. I think he added a lot. But then there's the other collab, Luna C with DJ Dooms. That went very differently. While Opus only did one section of Assignment 54X2A, uh, Dooms did all the percussion on Luna C. He is a much bigger part of that track success than I was myself. He actually took a while because when I first contacted him, he just started a semester at college and didn't have easy access to his software. He'd have to get demo software and make little snippets as loops that I could use to start out with. At first, I felt like what he gave me wasn't quite enough. Like, he gave me an excellent intro and two little amen break patterns that lasted like two seconds each, which I used to map out how I wanted the track to build up and drop, as it were. I then asked if he could maybe give me a couple more percussion snippets like that to keep the variety going. And uh, suddenly, once the semester was over and he had some time to properly work on it, he way exceeded all my expectations and gave me three, four entire layers of various percussion textures that ran over the entire track length. It was incredible, well made up for any wait or delays that caused, and I think he may very well may have given me some of the best work he's ever done. Well, to be fair, the stuff he's done himself isn't that similar. He's done a, he's done a pretty great uh, Vaporwave Trap al hybrid album called Indefinite Life, and he's done, he had this much more hard-hitting breakcore type EP called Some Terrible Music by Some Terrible Person, which uh, is a lot better than that title would have you believe, and it was what convinced me to have him on to help in the way he did. But yeah, I gotta give credit where credit is due. While I like the airy, ambient, for faux orchestral stuff that I did on Lunacy, a lot of what I did was just loops, and with his percussion included, he basically did like 75% of the work, if not more. I feel like I really owe him for that track. He made Luna see what it is, and I can't thank him enough for it. I haven't heard from him in ages. I don't. I wonder what he's been up to these days. All right then, those tracks were an interesting experience. Time for ramblings on other tracks here. Like I said, I don't think this album has many of my best tracks ever, but I made sure to make it as consistent as I could and as varied as I could. Tried to make sure that no track wasted your time. Maybe there are a couple of tracks that maybe don't add as much in context. Black Pearl Metallic, for instance, is a cool, spooky, dark ambient cut, but not much else. But works better in context as an element to help the pacing and as a breather to help cement the extreme rushes of its surrounding tracks, Space Map and Luna Sea. While I'm on the topic of Space Map, I may as well talk about those old uh, FL Studio tracks. These haven't aged all that well for me because I was just starting out with the software and hadn't really figured out its capabilities yet. Listen to the headphones especially isn't nearly as good to me now as it was in 2016. It's still marked as the featured track, it was basically a lead single that I'd released quite a while before, and because of how much I've plugged this album, it's my most played track on Bandcamp by a long shot. It does definitely have the feel of a track that can work well out of context, and I do still like the deep house-ish feels of the pianos further into the track. It's a nice tune, and one that did inform a fair bit of the direction on my next album as well. The other two FL Studio demos that made this album hold up much better for me, though. Space Map Go Ahead can feel a bit long-winded at times, but it is quite a bit of fast-paced fun. Again, I like the piano stuff I added to that. And The Highway of Dreams is a track that does a lot with a little for me. Just some very simple piano chords and a ton of reverb. It's great for when I'm not in the best mood. 
you just need something to relax to. The whole first half of this album is great for that. Really a lot of cool ambient stuff there. I mean, I do sometimes question whether Condition Check is the best possible choice for an opener since it's straight formless ambience isn't a very good representative for what's to come on the album. I mean, it's there because I had initially foreseen it as an album intro with The Highway of Dreams as the real opener until I thought up the actual album intros and outros which supplanted that purpose. Attention, ton of tangent. While those uh, intros and outros don't add a ton for me, uh, exiting the precinct has some really nice relaxing city ambience, and opening the void has all the cool, noisy experimentalism. I like their edition. The other two are mini bookends with not much reason to listen to out of context, but I digress. Condition check. Uh, that's pretty cool all the same. A lot of layers go into that one, and the acid project on that one is pretty thick. Basically went into that and threw like all these big ambient pad loops, just threw them together on the fly as just as they were playing and the effect was really cool. There are other tracks where I like them because they remind me of other artists I like. The track Air Bridge, for instance, that was initially titled Amy's Bridge when I first made it because I utilize a sample of Todd in the Shadows' dog, Amy, yipping while some movie soundtrack plays in the background. But I changed it to Air Bridge when I finished the track because I listened back to those pianos and they really gave me some vibes of the band Air, specifically their later pocket symphony era stuff. The saxophone also bit, uh, adds a little bit of flavor that reminds me of their track Tropical Disease. I felt like the connection with this band that's so defined my taste since my childhood seemed like a more appropriate way to name the track than the tiny dog barely audible in the background in that little middle section. There was also Field Magnetic Field, named after the Jean-Michel Jarre album Magnetic Fields. I was reminded of him through the use of those big synth pads near the end that sounded right out of his rendezvous period. But without question the biggest homage on this album was Sacred Geometry, the longest track at 11 and a half minutes, and my overblown tribute to BT's This Binary Universe. This track was like specifically trying to be like my take on his track, The anti kythera Mechanism. While my track is not even close to his detail as impressive as his and is pretty obviously derivative, I do still have a bit of a soft spot for this track, the way it combines all these strange ambient moments with all these dramatic orchestral sounds, the section where all the melody falls away in favor of random effects. That wasn't even in my first version of the track, it was added in later to sound more like a this binary universe type cut. This track is a lot, it can be a bit unwieldy, but I like the wide variety of sounds that goes into it and how it does have a semi-coherent structure underneath it. The second half of the album, The Void, has always come off to me as the weaker of the two halves, a bit less textural or immersive, and trying more to be epic, inspired by the likes of Hybrid. That probably comes off most obviously in tracks like the title track, saving the most epic and over-the-top moments in the album for the very ending, pulling out all the stops with the techno beats and the orchestras and the big dramatic pianos. That track's placement is inspired by my memories of Hybrid's Disappear Here album and its climactic penultimate track, Break My Soul. I remember thinking in high school that should have been the ending because it was the album's most epic moment. Although I now regard that album's actual ending, numb, to be a, a more emotionally satisfying way to finish. This ending, with closing the void tacked on at the end to give that sense of closure, it feels a bit more rushed and ambiguous, but it still has a shred of hopefulness to it. It was a bit how I felt at the end of 2016. I do think this disc's attempt at a more epic sound can get a bit overbearing, and tracks like From the Get-Go, which don't add much interesting flavor, can dampen the impact of other tracks around it. But I think I paced it in such a way with more low-key moments like Black Pearl Metallic and Wet Matchsticks to let the epic moments breathe more. The latter track I came up with the title first and hoped to come up with some kind of alien sounding ambient piece like Matchsticks, the closer of Aphex Twin Selected Ambient Works Volume 2, though it did not turn out that way. Maybe started out a little bit in that vein, but I basically just shoved three separate demos together and called it a day. Still a pretty interesting track though, a bit of prog rock influence bleeding through in that multi-part structure I suppose. The biggest highlights from this disc though are Metropolis, uh, which was an attempt at mixing the strengths of both Aston Music Studio and loop manipulation with the regular sequencing that I could do in FL Studio. 
in a tune that was inspired by like some city levels and video games, like a bit of Mushroom City from Mario Kart Double Dash influence in there, albeit much more over the top. That's also why that track basically loops twice. I initially envisioned it as if it were soundtracking a video game. Same with Gravity Expansion, I kind of envisioned that soundtracking some fire-themed level at the end of a Super Mario Bros. game. I really like having that key change going down, like, I remember hearing uh, Spectrum Pulse mentioning a key change down in some country song at one point. I can't remember what he was referring to specifically, but I, I in included a key change like that in this track, and that is probably the best part of this track as well. It makes the track start to live up to its title as it feels heavier and more menacing than it did before. But probably my favorite track on this half, and possibly in the whole album, is Subway Ride, which just has a fantastic build-up to it. Starting out all dreamy and low-key and slowly getting more and more dramatic and epic as it goes on, adding layers of strings and horns, and I, I love the way it sounds. And I have done so much incoherent rambling on all of these tracks, may as well close out this video. So, Spiral Out of Control is a lot. It really is the kind of thing that always takes me on a journey, and making it helps me through some tougher times in my life. This album may have come out in the beginning of 2017, but to me it will always be the 2016 album. That represents my headspace throughout that year. I just changed colleges and had to commute into downtown Chicago several days a week, and I designed this album to accompany my walks down the streets of Chicago at night. I think this album is the perfect soundtrack for walking around the city at night. But this being my 2016 album also ties in the title, uh, Spiral Out of Control, because 2016 was the year that the whole world started spiraling out of control and started our collective downslide into the depressive phase that I think all of us have felt in some way since. I also imagined this album soundtracking a whole movie in my head. I, like, I had the album cover ready before I seriously started work on the album itself, and I imagined it as this story about, like, the two anime people here going on a quest through the city to, I don't know, find their lost parents or something. And then the second hit disc, the city would slowly get enveloped by a black hole, which they'd have to stop and revert to normal. I don't know, this isn't a concept album or something that I have, like, vivid enough images in my head to actually make into a movie or screenplay or anything, beyond just a bit of inspiration in making the album. Influenced the whole aesthetic of it all. Came that DistroKid rejected the original album cover I had and made me make that alternate one with the black hole instead. I think someone used the original wallpaper with the anime characters running through the city as an album cover before me. I think the original is more fitting for the whole project, although people who hate anime can rest easy knowing I had to go with this one on Spotify and elsewhere. I think it fits in its own way as well. That album covers a relatively common criticism of this album, just a lot of people hate anime on principle. But yeah, uh, Spiral Out of Control. This is an album that I hold very close to me. It is designed completely around the aspects of my taste in electronic music and film soundtracks and all that kind of stuff. It's a very emotional journey for me, and to this day, the work I feel the proudest of so far. Although, after finishing it, I did feel like for my next album, I ought to move in a different direction. Move against my core instincts, which played into Spiral's sprawling length. Maybe make something shorter, like just 40 minutes or so. Maybe just eight tracks. Maybe also do something that I would never think to do on it and really put me out of my comfort zone. Directly make myself feel uncomfortable while making it. Like, I don't know, maybe putting my vocals in. And trying to write lyrics that actually meant something to me. Well, we'll see how that'll go the day after tomorrow.